grab what we could do theme song. Yeah, the problem is if you use a theme song that's copyrighted, you can't post it. Yeah. You need to create your own. Is Good morning, a... everybody. Hey, John. Hey, John. <laughs> hey, John's. Hey, good morning, afternoon, Hi. whatever it is. Good to see you, Linda. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. Look at all those faces. Well, do you want to wait for a couple minutes? You didn't uh, well, we should start. respect the time. Yes. But uh, it's good to see you. All good to see everybody. There's quite a number more that should be coming, but we'll respect the time and, and get started. Okay, well, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, and uh, good afternoon, good evening. I'm on the West Coast, so morning for me. Uh, thank you all so much for joining today to, to talk about perspective. Um, I'm Matt Chadsey. I'm a host here at Systems Thinking Daily. I'm a facilitator for eCornell, uh, teaching this work for uh, students there. And I apply these ideas every day to my consulting work, helping communities adapt to climate change. I'm super excited today to be hosting the second in our series with Derek and Laura on, uh, on their research. The goal of these sessions is to, uh, to make the underlying research in DSRP accessible to, uh, to you and to uh, the folks you work with and help build skills and effectiveness in your own work. Um, and I think these are these are really interesting sessions, right? It's we're just talking a minute ago. It's pretty rare that uh, you actually get to talk to the researchers and sort of explore the intricacies of of their work. So this is really a quite a quite a special opportunity, I think. Uh, just yesterday, planning for this session, I, I gained a couple new insights myself uh, just in a few minutes of of talking through these ideas. A uh, little introduction is needed, but just quickly, uh, Derek and Laura, they both serve on faculty at Cornell University teaching systems thinking, modeling, and leadership. Uh, they're sought after speakers uh, around the country and world uh, talking about systems thinking. And they're working with uh, organizations trying to solve some of our most complex and important problems. And perhaps most importantly, they lead the Cabrera Research Lab uh, with the vision of empowering um, 7 billion systems thinkers. So, and also want to do a special thanks to Lena Cabrera, who's done all the hard work getting us uh, organized for the session today and does many, many things on Systems Thinking Daily to keep things running smoothly uh, each and every day. So logistics for today, uh, we have about 45 minutes total. Uh, first, we're going to do a quick uh, perspective expanding challenge for you. Uh, next. Derek and Laura will present the research from the paper called um, Perspectives Organized Information in Mind and Nature that was published earlier this spring. Then we'll spend the remainder of the time uh, talking, uh, sort of casual conversation, asking questions and discussing some more uh, details about the, uh, about the work and about perspectives in general. And if you're new to ST Daily, these are pretty informal sessions. You know, don't be shy. At, please ask any questions that you have. Uh, truly, all questions are good questions here. And if you have it, uh, it's pretty likely somebody else does as well. Uh, and then finally, this uh, session is being recorded, as you just saw, and will be posted on System Thinking Daily in the next, uh, hopefully, week or so. And the, uh, if you missed it, the last session on the so-called fish tank study is now available um, and Alina is going to put a link in the chat for you there. Um, so with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Derek and Laura. Good morning. Oh. Thank Thanks. you. Good to see you all. So we are going to do the uh, brain teaser at the end. We thought that would be a little more fun uh, to do that after we sort of have this conversation. Might bring home some of the points of what we're talking about. Um, yes. Yes. So we're here to talk about uh, one of our latest research studies uh, on perspectives. And um, there are some things about perspectives that I think are unique in the sense that, you know, perspective is obviously a cognitive act. It's, um, it has positive and negative effects, but it's not really in and of itself positive or negative. I also think uh, in talking uh, through some things the other day, one of the things is that perspective is sort of, in my in my view, misunderstood in some ways, in the way that we think of perspective as our point of view, 
rather than what it actually is, the interaction between those two elements of point and view. So, did you have something to go? Oh, I was just gonna say that the perspective really in the research is is kind of a very root level thing. And, and so it's it lies underneath some things that you're extremely familiar with, like all those terms up there on the left, um, things like empathy, compassion, analytics, bias, stereotypes, conflict, prejudice, um, things like frame of reference, which is used a lot, for example, in physics, scale, which is used across the uh, natural sciences quite a bit, obviously point of view, viewpoints, mindsets, beliefs, opinions, all those kinds of things, uh, and, and even critical thinking and problem solving and all that type of stuff. So perspective is really one of those things that, you know, uh, you learn it and it lies at the root of so many other um, things. One example being empathy and compassion can't exist without perspective taking, for example, and we all know how important empathy and compassion are. So, well, I also just one other thing I've had is I think some of the things I'm hoping we can get across in the quick summary of this research is um, that because perspective is so widely used and has so many synonyms, I think we we walk through the uh, walk around thinking we really understand it at a deep level. And so I think because it's such a common English word, we don't really think about the underlying structure of the perspective taking that we we engage in. So we started um, looking at a few questions when we did this research, um, how perspectives form, um, what the dynamics are between point of view in perspectives, um, the role that they play both individually and socially in terms of cognition, um, obviously how perspectives are uh, related to metacognition, and what it means when we're more aware of the perspectives we're taking, what how that has effects on us, on our lives, and those kinds of things. So we did nine studies ourselves. We did a wider lit review, which we'll talk about probably later a little bit. Um, but we really wanted to, to focus on the elemental level of point and view and how perspective, those two things are like the others. We've talked about co-implying, they're interchangeable, um, Linked, obviously, yes. in a very special relationship. Existing in both mind and nature, um, you know, and, and so when we design these nine different experiments, we design them purposefully to kind of work as an ecology of experiments where one experiment informed the others to identify and isolate variables such as point and view and the unique relationship between point and view and also the dependencies of perspective on the other patterns, distinctions, systems, and uh, relationships. So uh, we designed it that way. And I'm happy to report this doesn't always happen, but um, it did in this particular case that we got high statistical um, uh, validity across all of the nine studies, which is kind of, uh, you know, no pun intended, significant. Um, <laughs> Alina will send you the, we'll put in the, at the actual paper. Um, and so you can read the paper, but we're going to try to go through the paper a little bit so that you can, you know, if, if you're not familiar with certain um, research terms or whatever, or if you are, we're, we're going to sort of walk, walk through what we found. Yep. And some of the things that we've talked about before that I think are relevant and why we should think about this is if you remember in, in a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, we talk about the fact that when people are asked to think something through, almost half of us have that moment of freezing up and not knowing what to do when someone asks us to think about something. And then of the half that actually do something re relative to thinking, if you look at this slide, what you'll see is that the thing that they do the least involves perspectives, involves perspective taking which I think is actually interesting because I think that we all walk around thinking we're really good at taking perspectives. But the fact is the data shows that we don't, we don't actually do that as much as we think we do and that we need to work on developing, you know, some of the fundamental skills that we talk about, which is um, to make sure that we're, we're very um, explicit about the perspectives we're taking to really focus on taking multiple perspectives on anything that we're thinking about 
and to um, remind ourselves that perspectives can be conceptual as well as anthropomorphic, you know, eyeballs. And we want to really think about um, developing those skills purposely because it it seems like we're not doing them as much yeah. as we think we are. And it's it, it, perspective. What this research shows is perspective is really a mind changing event. Um, it it has a it kind of like reverberates down your mental model and so the fact that we're that perspective is showing up last on this list in terms of uh the regularity with which most people are using it combined with the fact that it's so critically important is obviously a, a sort of a critical mismatch and of course the study that shows that um you know, we get the Dunning-Kruger effect of competency and, and confidence. And in particular, perspective is the widest uh, gap in of, of the DSRP and mixed um, is, right. is also pretty important. So uh, perspective is what we're the least competent in and the most confident about. Which is problematic, yeah, so. especially if you think about all of the things we're dealing with in the world and socially, we really need to get better at taking perspectives to really start to make some headway into these intractable problems that we're dealing with uh, writ large. And if you wanna know um, kind of what are the empirical conclusions that we can take away from this ecology of studies, this is a, a, a short list. And, and we tried to, um, we tried to, uh, create the list in such a way that um, the red part is kind of a very simple statement. And then the black part is kind of like a, a, a slightly more elaborated statement. So it's really easy to understand what, what is being said. Um, and Alina can send this paper as well. Um, this is a summary of all the different research that has this in it. So you don't have to read it all right now, but these are empirical conclusions that can be made as a result of these uh, these different studies that we're kind of reviewing today. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the things that I would just emphasize is if you read only one of these papers, that's great. If you read a lot of the papers on DSRMP, you're going to see some parallel uh, structure in the things that we're finding in that the elements exist that you know we have certain strengths and weaknesses in terms of seeing perspectives that are more like ours versus not. Um, the fact that uh, perspectives are uh, very interdependent on the distinction systems and relationships rules so that all four rules are influencing one another um, quite remarkably, I would say. Uh, so what we wanted to do also is just sort of leave you with this overview slide and see if uh, Matt, there are some questions that you wanted to start us off with. And if people have questions, I think they add them in the chat. Is that right? Or do they just speak up? Uh, yeah, no, go ahead and add them in the chat. That'd be great. And um, we might do some live, live questions as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one thing is obviously, as you say, people think they know about perspectives and it's talked about a lot. Could you talk a little bit about um, how this research fits in with the the bigger picture, the sort of the history of perspective research, you know, how this sort of adds to things um, that have been thought about before and, and how it's new. Yeah, so I mean, in the beginning of the paper, we sort of contextualize our own research, uh, how it's different from previous research and how it extends it. But if you look at the paper, you'll see that a lot of people have been thinking about perspective for a long time. There are different types of scientists and researchers who are doing things like, do plants have a perspective? It turns out plants have a perspective. Uh, they have things like they look at uh, mate display behaviors in different types of birds and how they take different perspectives to do that. Um, there was one person who talked about atoms having perspectives that we've interacted with a bit. Um, yep. These are cells yep. having perspectives, atoms having perspectives. Um, really quite profound in that uh, I actually talked to this this researcher and asked him point blank, are, are you being metaphorical? Because Dyson, who's a very famous physicist, talked about this as well, but he tended to talk about it in very metaphorical terms. 
But I said, are you being metaphorical or, or empirical? He said, I'm being 100% empirical. Um, so atoms have perspective uh, is the conclusion of, of, his, of his studies. And I would say, Matt, if people are interested in sort of um, the more well-known uh, research relative to perspectives that's not ours, I would say look up theory of mind or the Sally Ann experiments, and that'll get get to, uh, I would say, some of the more well-known research that's been done prior to this. Yeah, there's there's a long history, like Laura said, and, and the beginning part of the paper kind of uh, reviews some of those things. And then there's three different lit reviews that we've done that review over 150 different studies across the disciplines um, that that focus on very, you know perspectives and and other uh, patterns of, of DSRP. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Um, and one, I mean, there's some new folks on the call today. Could you give just a couple of really quick examples of the point and the view, just the the basics, just to make sure everybody has. Um, you know, has a good sense of how those two fit together, maybe just with some a couple of simple examples. Uh, sure. Well, some of the easier examples are people, obviously, right? So I am sitting here looking at this screen. I have a point. The point is me. And my view is this screen. Well, Derek is sitting here and he also has a point and he's looking at the same view. We may be focusing or seeing different things based on what we're thinking about uh, at the same time. It's just like when two people go and watch a movie. Well, they both have a perspective on that movie. They've seen the same view, but they interpret it differently. They get different things out of it. Now you can also change the view, obviously, right? So I can be looking at this screen and then I can turn and look at that screen. So that's two different perspectives because it's my point in view on this one, my point in view on that one. So you can change either one and the perspective will change. And Zoom actually gives you kind of a, a unique uh, perspective. No, Again, no pun intended. Uh, of the screens, because I, I bet you dollars to donuts that uh, Linda's screen that she's looking at in the configuration of all these different faces is different than mine. So even though we have the same parts in our view, the actual view that Linda's seeing or Mark's seeing or Hope's seeing is different than the one that I'm seeing. And, and you see that in Zoom mistakes all the time where you think that you say, oh, well, uh, let's start in the left hand top left hand corner with matt well matt isn't in the top left hand corner of everybody's screen right um so the view is different the part hole configuration is different the relationships are different based on the the point and the view even if in the case that we're talking about the parts are exactly the same they're ordered differently or they, they have different permutations that's a great example. I mean, one of the, I think the points of, pers of talking about perspective is that it's the root of a lot of problems, right, that, that, that occur in the world. And even the Zoom one, you know, there, how many meetings are like, who goes next and what happens? Or, you know, I call on you and surprise you because you're not actually, you know, next on your screen or whatever. And so even at that simple example, there's, you know, time wasted, confusion, sort of lots of work done because of that, that misunderstanding or lack of awareness that there's different perspectives. So that's a really nice, nice example. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, uh, in the description you showed earlier, it talks about perspective as a cognitive act, right? So, and obviously the examples you saw, you know, Laura's looking at one screen, another screen, you can sort of imagine, you know, the, the thinking behind that. But when you talk about an atom or a part in, you know, a place in space or a asphalt road or whatever, those don't seem super cognitive. To me, so could you kind of talk through, you know, how how you think about those as perspectives and how folks can kind of incorporate that in, into their own work? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and I think most people have some, you know, that's a stretch for, for most. So you're in good company. Um, I think what you have to do is sort of think of it as cognitive as just being sensory and perception, right? Like they're they're and plus the the whatever you're using to process that sensory perception. So atoms have a sensory per perception. They're bumping up against each other. Cells have it. Uh, there's there's actually a, a ton of research that's coming out. It's a very uh, again no pun, I'm not meaning to make these puns, but it's a very fertile area in plants. Um, it, it, that that uh, plants are are actually have like a perspective. They're following the sun. They 
They have a sensory experience and they're adjusting based on their perception of that sensory experience. And so, mm-hmm. no, atoms aren't sort of contemplating their navel like, like we might do, or they're not uh, thinking about what they're going to have for dinner or something like that, but they are in their own kind of atomic-like world, aware of the other things that are around them, and they're making uh, behavior as a result of that awareness, mm-hmm. right? Excellent. Yeah, that helps a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Scott asked a great question. Um, this is more about the research, but do you find that people um, have more trouble with the point or the view or the combination being the perspective or when, when you look at the research, kind of where do people get mm-hmm. stuck? And I guess to add to that, I mean, one of the goals of these discussions is you know, how we can sort of apply these ideas in our own work or you know, better relationships with people, understanding of systems you know, how, um, based on your answer, kind of what can we do to, to help um, them be more perspective yeah, that's a, I'll take that one too. That's a great question. And I, I wouldn't say that they have, um, that, that they're better or worse at P or V, which is point and view, bit, little P, little V. Big P is perspective. It's unfortunate that there's two Ps, but... Um, I would say the the difficulty people have is assuming that this big P is the same as this little P. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That the point is exactly the same as the perspective. And that is not the case. This is an equality, which means that perspective is the same as the relationship between point and view. So there aren't three things here. There's, There's one thing here perspective and that one thing is made up of two related things there the p on the left side is the same as the small p small v on the right hand side but most people per- mistake that perspective is the point hmm. right so the, you'll say you know my perspective is me right or or that thing's perspective is that thing but really it's that thing as an observer and what they're observing and the interaction effect between them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, and based on that equation, it's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it that way before. Two people literally can't have the same perspective. It's right? incredibly difficult. Because they would, they're always... They literally, yeah, they would literally have to have almost, like if you were to think about it in very uh, scientific terms, they would have to have the same evolutionary histories and, you know, you... It, I guess it's hypothetically possible because you can't have alternative universes in physics and things like that. But but in our regular world, uh, it's, it really isn't possible to have exactly the same perspective. It seems like maybe like atoms could, something that's very fundamental potentially could come closer, but maybe not even even that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Mark, Mark asked- It's pretty close though. I mean- yeah, I Mark, Mark, Mark like suggested in the um, in the chat, you know, like twins, but I think even twins, you know, now you know they have, even though it's a similar experience and similar genetics, there's still a lot of difference, right? Yeah, because their life experience is different. So even though they have a, a genetic similarity, which is going to obviously influence them, uh, their genotype is very similar, uh, but their phenotype, the way that genotype is expressed, is not always similar. So. Um, we see that in twins that have been separated at birth, where their genotype is relatively similar, but uh, their phenotype is possibly dramatically different versus mm-hmm. twins that grew up together. You know, they're going to have um, easier times with perspectives. Right. Interesting. Uh, here's another from John um, saying that um, our human perspectives always present in any view because we cannot access perspectives without our eyes, basically. Um, sort of, I, I guess, yeah. Our perspectives always there. Yes, that's actually one of the things that came out of this study is that there's always uh, what's called a root perspective. So even, even if you're making a map with perspectives on it, 
all of that is based on some root perspective, always, 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 always. And the root perspective is almost never explicated. Um, I imagine a world someday where anytime you see a graphic, the person has explicated the root perspective that that graphic has come from. But of course, when we look at graphics today, you never, the, the, nobody ever explicates, hey, this is my perspective that this graphic was made from, that this model or framework or whatever was, or this statement really was made from. So there's mm -hmm. always a root perspective. It's almost always implicit, but it's always there. Well, I also would, I also think one of the complications I will say with perspective is there's a big difference between me sitting here and taking Derek's perspective or me standing up and sitting in Derek's chair and seeing Derek's perspective. So the mm -hmm. first case is I'm actually imposing my pers my perspective of his perspective versus actually being in his perspective. So it's like first order and second order perspective taking. And I think that's a really hard distinction for people to, to know and also to operationalize in that sense. Are you going to and, Yeah, one of the studies was actually a pretty fascinating study. Um, we called it the, what, what is the plant study? And um, what we're we- are good at naming studies. <laughs> right. <laughs> where is the plant study and what is fascinating about this was we yeah. we literally asked people a very simple question of the plant is to the left or to the right showing them four different pictures the plant is to the left or the right and you'll notice that in the congruent situations where our perspective the root perspective of the of the participant was aligned with the images perspective they got it right significantly more, uh, a third of the time more often. Yeah. So just the fact that their perspective was out of alignment with the perspective of the image decreased the, uh, the answer choices uh, pretty significantly. Well, and I would hazard to say that's, that's true, not just of physical perspective yes. types of questions, but just anytime we're talking about perspective. Right, those differences make it hard as, harder for us to see the other person's perspective. You think about politics and those kinds of things. Yeah, another way of saying this is uh, it's easy to agree with people when they agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> would, would you say that's a, a, a <laughs> how to say this sort of less energy for them to to change perspective? Yeah. Is that is that kind of it? Just takes more effort. So it's just more brain. cognitive effort. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. It, yeah. And just think about how many times you've been in a conversation when somebody says to you, I don't think you see my perspective, but what they really mean is you're not agreeing with my perspective, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So we conflate those two very often in our, in our communication, not our communication, right. but in communication generally. Right. Yeah. That actually raises a question that uh, another question I wanted to, to ask kind of the difference between perspective and then filling in say gaps in a, in a map, you know, in a model, right? So if I go to the doctor and I say, you know, I have a sore foot, right? And, you know, that's my perspective. My foot is sore. She may respond with something technical. You know, she might say I have uh, metatarsalagia, you know, which is a soreness in the foot from a doctor's perspective. And so is she, does she have a different, I mean, she obviously has a different perspective because she's a different person, but is she sort of filling in information in my model by teaching me this, this technical name? Or is she, you know, changing my perspective or because as you talked before, DSR and P are kind of always interrelated. Um, so how do you how do you sort of untangle that? Because I think like Laura just said, a lot of times people <clears throat> sort of think, oh, I have to take their perspective or, you know, I have to agree with them or whatever to, to move forward in a conversation or something like that. So how do you kind of untangle perspective from the other elements or not? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I hope this makes some sense, but we I often hear when you're in a debate about something, especially like a scientific debate that uh, or or you know politics or whatever, that that oh well that's just semantic. Mm -hmm. Well, so what does that's just semantic mean? That's just semantic means that um, we're saying the same thing, but we're using different words. So in other words, like if I'm speaking English and Mark is speaking French, then all we have all we need to to kind of understand each other as a translatory device to translate English into French or French into English, right? Um, 
that's semantics. But, but if we actually disagree, and both of us are speaking, say, English, um, the way to tell that, the way to tell whether it's semantics or something different is to look at kind of your mental model. So if you use the word foot pain and she uses the word, I forgot the word you use, but some medical term, that might be semantic. You might literally have the same model. But if you look at the parts and how they're related, her model might be, you might presume that her model is more sophisticated than yours. And yours is, is quite a bit more simpler, but also more personal and more pragmatic to your particular pain and things like that. So you'd have to, in order to know whether that was just semantics or not, you'd have to delve into that person's, the both people's mental models. And if those mental models completely overlap, it structurally, and there's one-to-one -one differences in wording, then that truly is semantic. But otherwise, it's not. It's meaningfully different. Really interesting. Um, so Linda just asked a question, which I is, is really related to this, or made a statement, but I wanted to see. She said, um, the distinctions we make inform our perspectives, and we all make our own distinctions. Um, one way I look at that is actually you you could agree on distinctions right like yes like the parts of the foot you know we could agree on the way we want to break down you know the parts of the foot and we could both agree on that so is is it true that people can um sort of agree on distinctions or um or is there always sort of a slightly different flavor there and I hope I'm doing justice to your to your question Linda or statement I think I'm not sure I may I know that quite. I think what you're saying is yes, they can we can come to the same distinctions from different perspectives, right? But that's clearly a function of being able to articulate what that distinction is at a, maybe at an, another level of um, specificity. Um, and from a science from kind of a scientific perspective, what this research is showing is that the those any distinction we make, literally, if we make the, the distinction dog, and everybody here conceptualizes what that word means as soon as I say it, dog. And, and, and the question is, do we have the same distinction? And the answer is no, we don't. None of us have the same distinction of dog. But what we do have, and, and these various research studies, there's about 28 of them that we did in all these different papers. This, this is just nine of them. Um, what they show is that every distinction is actually like a statistical cloud. So there's a center to that cloud. And we, and you know, like it's almost like if we all shot at the same target, we wouldn't exactly hit in the same hole, right? But we would hit in a in a right. in a cloud around that target. So every distinction is really scientifically a statistical cloud of centeredness. And, and where that cloud exists is where the distinction exists. But you and I don't actually share the same distinction for the most simplest and everyday things, never mind things that, you know, are, that could be debated. Things like what is a, you know, what is coffee or what is, you know, <laughs> bread or something like that. Uh, even those things, we have different, technically different distinctions, but they're in the same relative cloud. And that's what allows us to sort of like, carry on in life. So in, in building model to carry that theory on then, that's a, that's a really good kind of uh, visual. Like if the cloud, the bigger the cloud is, or if there's two clouds that are just overlapping, yeah. that's when your model is broken. And well, your I'm goal, thinking. it seems like your goal in like in an organization to develop a shared model or whatnot is basically to make that cloud as small as possible. So we're all thinking, you know, hunting dogs or something like yeah. that is, yeah. is is the subset, even though we're all still going to have a little bit different flavor of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, you want that 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 spread pattern to be as tight as possible. The tighter it is, the more kind of the more you're communicating uh, mm -hmm. quickly. Interesting. Yeah, I can imagine like words like perspective or sustainability or things like that. I mean, the cloud would be enormous because people enormous. just take take those all in all directions really interesting or, or what's good for american democracy today mm -hmm. right you, i mean you know putting it in our common day terms i mean the reason that we're having so many difficulties in our country right now is because the answer to that 
is so diverse that it is like probably six or seven different clouds. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, whereas in a, you know, in the past, perhaps it, it was much more of a, um, uh, much more of a singular, a singularity or something like that. So we yeah. can actually see this in network analyses of Congress and the voting patterns of Congress that Congress used to vote kind of like this. Mm -hmm. now, they, now they vote like this. Yeah. They're separated. Yeah. They're completely separated. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, um, I had a question and uh, Robert asked a really similar question. So this is more about, um, you know, how we can apply this in our work and um, both how, Robert asked how you can um, explore the point and view relationship, you know, further in general situations. And sort of the add on I'll do that is, you know, what have you seen in your consulting and working with different folks on, on models and building perspectives that's, you know, really most useful, like how, what are the ways to, uh, what, you know, the shortcuts to really useful, valuable ways to, um, to apply this idea in, in real situations? I think, I think really, you know, I, one thing that the reason it's called systems thinking daily is we want to really start to think of these things in the micro, like in the small things we're doing every day, right? So, you know, if you're constantly uh, pushing yourself to see things like the perspectives in your interpersonal communications on a day-to-day -day basis and always reminding yourself that your perspective is different yeah. than others and questioning what do they see, right? I know what I see, what do they see? And trying to figure out what the differences are. And sometimes those differences land in a place where there's a dis there's a, the, a distinction that we are thinking different things, but using the same word and identifying those kinds of mistakes between and among our communication patterns. That's how point view can help with that. I would also say when you're thinking about or starting to think about any kind of system or a problem, Remind yourself, you know, that there are many different ways to frame it, many different ways to think about it. Challenge yourself to take different perspectives. And as you were talking about, Matt, like conceptual perspectives, right? So, you know, it's one thing to take the perspectives of all the things with eyeballs inside of a system. But what about a perspective of sustainability or a nature-based solution or cutting the cost or reducing division in groups? Those things can all change and alter the way that you're seeing that system and also to challenge you to say like, okay, the person next to me is an expert in economics. Yep. What's that person's perspective on my problem? The person next mm -hmm. to me is an expert in knitting. What's their perspective on my problem? And, mm -hmm. and sort of getting fluid with that, that uh, interrogation, I would say, of your mental models and also thinking about it in your day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Absolutely. What would you say? Same thing probably. Yes, same thing. I, I think what the, what I what I think is remarkable about the, the the results of this research is is really that it kind of tells you um, it kind of tells you like four basic things, right? The the first is um, one that we're getting away in systems thinking from kind of what the the general field has done, which is like everybody's opinion frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's got an opinion about what, what systems thinking is, which ironically is like perspectival, right? And we're getting to something a little bit more empirical about what systems thinking is, number, number one. Number two is this research really strikes at the existence of perspective, in the real world, in nature, and the um, and the existence in in nature, but also in mind. So the studies are designed to to isolate this variable and also this variable, and then also the effectiveness. Like if if you know about perspective, point, and view, will it increase your effectiveness? And we got really good results on all of those areas. And the third thing that I would say is, uh, and this goes along the lines of existence, is it would, if we isolate the point and the view as variables and the relationship between them, then we can use those to know more about the world, right? 
we can, we can use those variables because we always know in every situation that there's going to be a point and a view variable and a relationship between them. Mm -hmm. And that relationship is critically important and was tested in this research because you can ask yourself, okay, so if this is like, what's, this is the view, it's the same view I'm looking at, but the point really sees that view differently. What is it about the way that that point relates to that view that leads to such a different perspective? So that leads to a deep empathy and understanding. So ironically, it's the relationship between them, uh, th that variable that's critically important. And the fourth thing that these studies really point out is that if relationship is, if perspective is uh, this dynamic relationship between point and view, that that thing is codependent on three other things. And those three other things are D, S, and R. Codependent, meaning this thing, uh, who said it earlier? Linda said also that could be near, oh no, not, no. Yeah, near and far. No, it was, uh, who said something? Near the distinctions we make inform our perspectives and we all make our own distinctions. That's true, but it's only half true because the, dis the perspectives we make affect our, the distinctions we make. And if you make a, a new distinction, it can also alter your perspective and vice versa. So these two things are codependent. We, we call that codependent. They're, they're interdependent on each other. And to me, those four things are what I would pull out of this research. Yeah, I love the the last one. One of the the things that I think uh, I see a lot in in um, the students that I work with is, you know, they do their map and they feel like it's done. And to get this sense of the iterative, iterative process, right? That you're continually, you know, everything you learn, any little change you make to your your map and the DSRMP changes or could change everything else. And so to continually kind of work through and make it smarter and smarter is a right. being sort of curious about that is probably one of the most powerful um things to be a good good system sinker it seems to me and we we matt along those lines we've all had that experience or i think we all have of, of like we have a map and then all of a sudden some new thing comes to our mind some new distinction and then as soon as that one distinction is added to a map of 20 or 30 things or 100 things it causes you to take a perspective that's different and completely redo the map. Mm -hmm. So that's the power of that interdependency is a new distinction can, can cascade your perspective and a, a new perspective can cascade your distinctions mm -hmm. and your systems and your relationships. So it really is very dynamic what the brain is doing. And, it, and, it, and if you understand those dynamics mm -hmm. and the simple rules, it doesn't have to be complicated. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite simple. Mm -hmm. But that's also why it's very useful to use perspective as a limiting and expanding factor in your maps, right? So the framing and stopping, like yeah. any framing or any fropping rule is in fact a perspective, which is meant to help reduce that sort of massive complexity and those massive maps you could create and get them to be a little more focused. I would actually, I, I would actually add that as a fifth takeaway is the... There you go. A lot of people think that perspective <laughs> always expands your analysis. Yeah. But perspective can constrict your analysis. Focus. Mm -hmm. Right? It can constrict your analysis. And that's what framing and stopping rules are all about. You say, let's just look at this from the perspective of cutting $28 million from our budget. Well, that's a, a super limiting perspective. That's narrowing your analysis or, or your thinking. Mm -hmm. Whereas you could say, let's get everybody's opinion on this. Well, that's going to expand your thinking mm -hmm. and it's it's not good or bad it's we do different things in different contexts for different reasons and your brain can can do all of it it's just a kind of a remarkable little device that we have in this hard thing up here <laughs> but that's also a mismatch i think a lot of work in business right they they don't do that control of that perspective and so they're asking you know feedback from everybody on everything when all they care about is that budget and specific changes to that budget so that's an opportunity to make models a lot cleaner and make work a lot more efficient it seems like in in, in problem solving to yeah. uh, to do that
Um, so we're close on time. I have one more super quick question. What we might do, I wanted to be sensitive to folks' time, is sort of stop at 10.15. If people want to stay for the uh, perspective uh, challenge, uh, you can. But also, don't, I, I understand people may have uh, constrained their time uh, to 45 minutes. So the last thing I just wanted to ask is, would you recommend, you know, when we work with our teams at work or our families or, or whatever, should we um, uh, teach point in view, you know, show what a the point in the view and, you know, spend a minute sort of orienting to what a perspective is? Is that uh, useful? I know you've done that in your research and it has big uh, benefit, it seems like. Um. Sorry, say that one more time. I missed. Should we teach a point, and you know, should we spend a minute before a meeting, you know, a problem-solving meeting or something else, teaching oh, yeah. a point in a view, you know, drawing the equation and describing it in in a minute? Is that helpful? I think it's. I think it's helpful. I think actually, what's um, what might be actually as helpful is to really take a moment to have each each person involved in that collective activity to articulate their perspective mm -hmm. and then to try to identify where there are gaps so that as you're starting to work through something, you can start to see where the distinctions could predictably be different, what the mm -hmm. relationships that are seen or not seen, where those differences could be based on those perspectives. So, I mean, I think when you when we teach, I'll, I'll be honest, when we teach people that perspective is a relationship between point of view, it actually takes a little while for them to get used to that idea that it's a re relationship between them. And then we start giving them examples of like movies and networks and, you know, even Zoom things. Uh, but it's it's a hard thing for people to sort of grasp because we're, mm -hmm. and as, as I said in the beginning, perspective to us, we've grown up uh. with the word and we know, we know, what are you doing? Oh, we know we always think that perspective is like our point and we have to really mm -hmm. disabuse people of that. And that takes a while because we've grown up our whole life thinking we have a perspective, right? right. Zess it, it's ours. Not good. Right. All right, so we're going to do a brain teaser. We're going to do a brain teaser, but I might have just ruined the first one if, it, if you're a quick visual study. So what do you think that is? They're going to type a tip of a pen. Tip of a pen. Pencil. Pencil. Orange. orange. Nice. Go. Okay. <laughs> oh. So that's the answer. That's what it is. And then the next one. What do you think that is? Ah, that's interesting, Hope. Interesting. The, pe the pencil looked like the beat. Oh, pepper. 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 Nice. Look at that. It's not a pepper. And what do you think that is? That one's interesting. A stem. A stem. Other ideas, stem. Dinosaur bone. Dinosaur <laughs> bone, yeah. Nice. So this is just a, a little exercise that, that we play around with. Um, it's amazing what what little cues that come into play, the more parts you have of the thing, you get more um, uh, understanding of what it is. Um, right, and the point is, you know, you're all looking at the same thing and you are seeing similarly and differently. And it all depends on your perspective. You know, when I first saw the stem, I thought it was some sort of fuzzy worm because I don't know, it was in the context <laughs> of something else. and. I mean, it's just fascinating. This is what we do with groups with our students, you know, to really get them to understand that we can all be looking at the same thing and have completely different perspectives on it and how it changes the distinctions we make in those kinds of things. You know. Exactly. Very good. Well, with that, um, I just want to thank Derek and Laura for spending time with us. I, I learned a lot again, and uh, we'll continue to. We could probably talk about perspectives uh, every, every week and uh, still explore more. Um, thanks everybody for joining. I appreciate there's great questions and also uh, some good chat uh, going on as well. So really appreciate that. I hope you'll join us. Our next session is uh, November 3rd, which is about part whole systems, uh, yeah. which is a thing that maybe, you know, it's a little more um, sort of uh, familiar maybe in, in ways than perspective, but also super important to, to mapping and can be pretty fun to, to dig into the research and understand how we organize things and uh, think about part whole systems. 
So um, with that, and again, feel free to carry on the conversation if you have further questions and want to post them in the Systems Thinking Daily uh, chats and whatnot, uh, definitely do that. And we can all sort of continue this conversation as well. Yeah. So with that, thank you very much. Good to see some new faces and uh, we'll see you in the community. Good to see you all. Thanks, everybody. And bye, Scott. <laughs>